My wife and I had a son, our fourth child, and it tested me as my, and my abilities to be a pediatrician. Now, I've got a story that I want to make as linear as possible, so I'm going to read most of this. Our other three children had been seven or more pounds, and this child was smaller, but he was still within the normal range. My wife was in, unable to nurse him, as she had plenty of other things to do. I did not push it, as we had been taught that bottle feeding was just as good as the breast. We got samples from all the baby formula company representatives who wanted me to be satisfied with their products, of course, and recommend them to my patients. He was full of gas and colic right from the start. We assumed it was a cow milk allergy and switched to soy, then to goat milk, and to a protein amino acid formula. Each one worked for a, a day or two, and then came the same colic as if he had become sensitive to the new milk. He could not tolerate any of them. By experimenting, we found if we put two quarts of skim milk into a big pot and let that simmer for five hours, he could sleep for maybe four hours and his stools would firm up. We tried to comfort and love him, but he stiff-armed us as if we were getting too close. He was a trial and an enigma, but since he was growing and gaining, uh, we assumed he would eventually outgrow the, these problems. If we took him for a ride to calm him, he would be fine unless we had to stop for a red light. He needed that constant vibration and hum from the motor. The motion distracted him from his gut ache. We did not want him to suck his thumbs, so we had him use that knock pacifier. That's the safest one for the dental arch. A suppository helped him pass rectal gas. Now, some nights when he was crying because his pacifier was lost, I would stand at his bedside and put one finger in his mouth to suck on and one finger lubricated properly in his rectum to pass gas around. So that I'd stand there for a few minutes sucking, passing gas, then you go back to sleep, and I'd slowly tip back, tiptoe back into bed, and then he'd cry again in an hour or two, and I'd get up and say, now did I have this finger in his mouth or this finger? It was, it was very confusing. It was a difficult time for us. What a way to learn about intestinal physiology. If we switched the milk back to one of the samples we got free, he would bellow again. When the colic quieted, he was about 10 months old, and we were careful about starting solids. Applesauce and pear were okay, but anything green like peas and beans would start it all up again. Milk from the cow was a poison. The sensitivity to milk moved from his gut to ear infections. At age three years, he had asthma, a phlegmy chest cough. By the time he was six, we realized that he was a bedwetter. But this is interesting. He only wet on Monday, Wednesday, and Fridays, which seemed odd as the psychiatry books said a bedwetter was paying his mother back for some real or imagined put-down. If he hated his mother that much, why didn't he wet every night? That was the psychiatric problem that I had to deal with. It was only Monday, Wednesday, and Friday. Finally, we figured out that uh, at school he was getting milk on Monday, Wednesday, and Friday, and he got apple sauce or apple juice as a snack on Tuesday and Thursday. So it was uh, something to do with the milk. Here's the milk again. My wife was upset because she knew I was a bedwetter, and here was a kid that looked like me. <laughs> Why did we have to pass this genetic problem on? So we sent a note to school and stopped the milk, and he stopped wetting the bed. No more bedwetting. Now, I wonder how many people out there have kids who are wetting the bed, and it turns out that they don't hate their mother. It's really because they're sensitive to something. The bladder is... Uh, uh, sneezing sort of and squirting the milk out. That must be the problem and a dilemma for a lot of people and psychiatrists too. We noticed that he was delicate and sensitive. He was very intelligent, had many projects and enthusiasms. He studied about Egyptian pharaohs. He collected stamps, leaves, pictures, pamphlets, anything. He read constantly. He loved music. He was a scholar. The teachers loved him because of his enthusiasm for learning. He became an accomplished oboist and a proficient linguist. Once when in high school, he asked how he could get a better grade from the history teacher. I had taken a course in behavior modification and suggested that he lean forward with his eyes focused on her and nod appropriately when she was lecturing. It worked too well. <laughs> she kept him after class and told him all about her crack marriage and all her life's disappointments. He got a good grade, but he had to transfer out of that class. He was uncomfortable with the teacher's solicitude. He always won if we played word games or anything involved with a dictionary. He was sensitive to noise, so did better if he worked on projects by himself. He pulled my wife and me aside when he was about 17 years old, and with much hesitation he told us that he was gay. 
Yes, we both said. So? <laughs> you know, he said, you're not mad? You won't throw me out? We, my wife and I, of course not, Duncan. We love you. We've known you were gay for some time. The way you walk, your mannerisms, the fact that you never dated girls, all these things pretty much gave you away. But so what? That, that was our attitude. My trouble with this diversity in our family stemmed from the training we had in medical school. A homosexual boy became this way from training, upbringing, and from an unresolved Oedipal complex. Psychiatrists at that time felt that if a boy felt strongly in his relationship with his mother, but was afraid of his father, out of jealousy, it might, the father might hurt or castrate him, it was safer to identify with the mother, so the boy became effeminate. It was safer. I was taught that at school, although it sounded a little far-fetched. I had always wondered if I would make a better father for girls than boys because I was not much of a sports lover. I did a little football in high school, but quit when the coach told me, Smith, you're not worth a fart in a whirlwind. <laughs> Gosh, how about that for a downer? I became the school cheerleader. I love music, art, theater, and related activities, the things we usually assume are female interests. So here we were with a gay son. We accepted him. He was ours, and we did not throw him out. He told us that many of his gay friends had been booted out of their homes because they admitted they were gay. To those families, a homosexual son represented some sort of sinful way of life. They believe God does not condone that lifestyle. If they could not beat it out of the son, the son had to go. What a stress for them. Many people still assume that the boy becomes gay by choice. At about this time, I attended a conference on homosexuality. The researchers reported that they could produce homosexuality in rats by injecting them with male hormones to the female and female hormones to the male on the fourth day of their lives. Not the third or the fifth day, the fourth. They had made these animals homosexuals. They said that the fourth day of a rat's life is equivalent to the human fetus at about three weeks along in the first month of the human pregnancy. At that time in the male fetus, some androgen wafts over the male brain and programs it for maleness. It, it does not happen to the female. The male baby grows to manhood and his genitals show the male characteristics of penis and testicles. If, however, he did not get that programming from the androgen as a fetus, when he becomes sexually mature, he will lust after males, not females. He becomes sexually interested in males. He is mentally a female. Duncan told us that when he began to mature as a young adolescent, he noticed that he was looking at male crotches and not at female breasts and bottoms as did his brothers and male peers. As he went through adolescence, he had a number of boyfriends. He brought them home so we could meet them. We showed acceptance. We had him go to dancing school in the eighth grade. That was kind of a laugh. <laughs> he hated it, but we insisted as we wanted him to learn some social graces. How naive we were. He hated the Portland gay scene. Not much choice when he went to a gay bar. After a few drinks and an overnight with some new boyfriend, he had to terminate the relationship because he could not find anyone interested in books, literature, and music. It was a lonely life. In 1976, he went to New York. He found a job as a law clerk and typist. He went to school and jumped into the gay scene with gusto. It was the high point of his life. But he did catch the virus that causes AIDS. He tested positive for that virus. He came home to the safety of our home. He became sicker, lost weight, developed the Kaposi skin lesions, and the disease that took him was pneumocystis. He died Feb February 7, 1991. But we had contacted a doctor who would oversee his care. He was sick enough at one point that he needed the hospital care. I asked the doctor if he would order intravenous vitamin C. I wanted to see if it was going to work. The doctor's response. I won't do that. If you want me to send his records to someone else, I will. Now, well, forget it. That night, armed with a syringe full of 20 grams of vitamin C, my wife and I went to Duncan during visiting hours. He was semi-comatose, so he did not know that we were about. As my wife stood guard at the door to make sure the nurse didn't surprise us, I plunged five grams into each of four sites, his thighs and upper arms, and then the, the next day, the doctor called to say that the oxygen and the antibiotics were improving him, implying that vitamins were not necessary. He didn't know. <laughs> but I knew that vitamin C was making a difference. Aha, an important point. 
We also had him treated at the National College of Naturopathic Physicians. They taught me how to use hydrotherapy. That's alternating hot and cold packs on his chest combined with electrical stimulation with a sine wave machine. It took about 45 minutes to complete. I did this at home for him three times a week. He would not cough for 12 hours after he got that hydrotherapy. It was incredible. I gave him intravenous vitamin C and intramuscular shots of B12. He, however, insisted on taking AZT. My feeling that is if someone is healthy, the drug is not harmful. But if one has a poor immune system and is already sick, it causes further deterioration. The doctor monitored his T cell count, which was slowly going down. In the la it should be above 700 anyway. But in the last 18 months of his life, he rested, ate good food, and kept surprisingly alert with a T cell count of less than five. We were holding steady, but making no improvement. Yeast infections and the destruction of his lungs were pushing him on to his death. I was impressed with the holding benefits of nutrition. I had plenty of time to put this young man's life into a perspective that I could understand. He was our fourth child. He was born 11 months after his next older brother, a big, healthy, vigorous, and obviously heterosexual male. I had read the work of Weston Price, the dentist who had found out about nutrition in primitive people, and he knew that primitive peoples showed how important optimal nutrition is for the formation of teeth, bones, and general health. Most primitive tribes have rules about the timing of the birth of their children. I understand that in some tribes, if a child is born in less than 18 months from the next older sibling, they do some significant cutting up of the father. Ouch! They have learned that the mother's body is not ready to carry and nurture another fetus until some months have passed. There is a lesson here, and I'm not exactly sure if I can really pin it down. His mother is and was a healthy woman. That is Duncan's mother, my wife. But perhaps if we had given her more vitamins and minerals during her pregnancy with Duncan, the outcome would have been different. We gave him good nutrition after the fact. Let me know if you have some thoughts on this. I would be interested.